Get rid of your credit card debt, get a lower monthly payment, and skip your next two house payments at SaveWithConrad.com. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to save thousands with SaveWithConrad.com. Find out how much money you can save right now at SaveWithConrad.com. How's it going, everyone? It's time for another edition of Strictly Business with Eric Bischoff. I, of course, am John Alba, but I am not alone. I am joined by the beautiful bald man of the hour, Mr. Eric freaking Bischoff. How are we, my friend? Post 4th of July. It's a Thursday as we tape this. What's going on there in beautiful Wyoming? Just uh, winding down. Uh, it's been a fun, you know, five or six days, friends and family in town. Our daughter was here in Montana and, uh, just had a, you know, relatively relaxing, but, uh, enjoyable four or five days. So getting back to you normal. Know I, you know what I care about? I care about knowing what was on the menu this past week. Uh, what was on the menu this week? Nothing really uh, too crazy. You know, I did a Wagyu beef tenderloin, which was pretty awesome. Uh, I've gotten pretty good at those. Uh, smoked some chicken. Mr. B made an amazing pot of uh, green chili, which is a kind of Fourth of July tradition here. And uh, that's about it, man. Nothing too, nothing too crazy. Hey, you know what? That sounds like you were eating good at the end of the day, and I know that's what matters on the Fourth of July. You get family there, you get friends there. Life is good, and uh, we've got a lot of our friends and family here with us. Eric Bischoff. We got your boy Mick Mac, who I'm pretty sure it's like 3:30 a.m. <laughs> He's tuning in. Says, hope everyone over there had a great 4th of July. Happy birthday, Mrs. B. Also, McMack says. So sending the best wishes over there. We got Josh Henney, who's on the road. Says, hello, everyone. Driving back. This is Strictly Business. And Eric, because it's Strictly Business, I figured, you know, we had so much success doing that live show out in Fresno. Why don't we do another? And that's what you and I are going to be doing on July 23rd for MCW at the MCW Fan Jam in Joppa, Maryland from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. They're going to be having a free convention with a bunch of different vendors, including Eric Bischoff. And if you purchase any of the Eric Bischoff meet and greet options, you're going to get admission to a live stage show edition of 83 Weeks and Strictly Business. You and I back in the saddle again, Eric. How much are you looking forward to that weekend? I am. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be a fun weekend, and it'll be fun to get up on stage with you. Great wrestling fans in that part of the country, so I'm definitely looking forward to it. Stone's Throw from Jimmy's Famous Seafood, too, so you know. By the way, that's another thing that I had, Jimmy's Famous Seafood. Uh, we did have some Jimmy's uh, Famous Seafood crab cakes as well over this past weekend, and uh, awesome, as always. Absolutely awesome. Always awesome. Go support them, and you can support us here. Visit mcw25.com and we will have a blast out there hope to meet a lot of you guys and thank you so much for supporting strictly business eric i feel like last week uh the internet was ablazing at our episode with matt cardona now that you've had some time to marinate it uh, what were your thoughts on our conversation with matt uh, it was kind of eye-opening you know it was refreshing that's a better way to say it. It was refreshing because while I knew of Matt, I didn't know Matt. I didn't know anything at all about Matt. So uh, listening to how uh, Matt has built a business for himself and how he went about doing it and his view of the independent wrestling scene and, and all that, was uh, it was re really refreshing. I enjoyed it. Get a lot of great feedback from him, too. Yeah, he's awesome, and he was so grateful uh, to be on this show. He really expressed that to me. He said that you told him behind the scenes that you would have booked him to go over Bret Hart in WCW back in 99. I don't know if uh, that was on the record or not, but he did mention that to me. So. Yeah, we uh, we talked a little bit about that. Okay. <laughs> got, hey, 25 years ago today, Eric, Hulk Hogan, Goldberg, Georgia. Yeah. I know you're doing a special presentation for ad-free shows tonight as we tape this, but... Any general thoughts 25 years ago today as we tape this? No, it's just funny, you know, because uh, the Ad Free Shows team have been promoting this watch along that we're doing tonight. And it's going to be live. And if you're part of the Ad Free Shows community, you can join in and watch and 
We're going to have some fun for sure. Um, special guest, surprise, all that good stuff. But uh, it's really fascinating how, you know, 25 years later, my timeline was blown up this morning uh, with people talking about it, acknowledging it, and of course, sharing their opinions of it. So it was, uh, it's, you know, it's cool to, to have been involved with something that resonated so powerfully with people, not only then, but still now, that's kind of cool. I think it's amazing that people still look back so fondly at that as this transformative moment in wrestling history, 40,000 fans, millions of people watching a really special moment. Go check that out adfreeshows.com man you mentioned your timeline i just saw we'll throw a little plugs here both you and i are on threads the new platform i know this isn't wrestling related but you're a pretty in tune guy a smart guy what do you think of all of these different platforms popping up as twitter alternatives do you see a, a viable path for that and i'm curious to see how wrestlers in particular take advantage of those branding opportunities and trying to hop on these new outlets uh, any thoughts on any of that eric I, nothing other than just curiosity, you know, uh, it, I, I don't know how viable another platform is. Are they just going to split the pie or, you know, look, Facebook Meta has probably got a much deeper and stronger relationship with the advertising community because they've been at it longer. Sure. Um, if that's the case, then I think, you know, Zuckerberg's got a real hand up because ad supported platforms like this are going to do well. And I know, well, I don't know, I read, I hear that Musk is having a difficult time with that. So we'll see, you know, uh, it'll, it's, it's hard to get people to break their habits, you know, and I think people have become so habitualized and addicted to Twitter for so long that I think a lot of people will be like me and probably you where, you know, you just end up writing both, maybe splitting your time between them. But uh, I, you know, I, I went on just because I want to see, I, you know, the greatest way for me to learn something is to do it and not just read about it. So I thought, what the hell I'll go on and, and see what this platform is. I've done the same with TikTok and other platforms. Um, didn't like TikTok at all and deleted that app, but um yeah, we'll just see where it goes, man. If it blows up, and I'll probably blow up with it. If it <laughs> just divides the pie, then I'll be spending a little time on both. I think one of the beautiful upsides of a platform like a Twitter or what Threads is intending to be when it's working at full strength is that it does become like a real-time public gathering space. Like I think it's one of the coolest things ever, Eric, that Fans can turn on a wrestling show that's airing live. And even though they're not sitting next to each other, they can have a public conversation in real time about it. And it always makes me wonder, what would that have been like in the Monday Night Wars era? Where you had two super hot shows going on at the same time, millions of people tuning in and then engaging, creating engagement in this social public square platform where you can bounce off one another in terms of conversation, I think it would have made for an amazing fuel for the, not just advertising community, but uh, the product as well, as far as wrestling is concerned. Well, especially with regard to the Monday Night War, because of course, Nitro and Monday Night Raw were head to head and, and they were live. So, I mean, it just would, would have absolutely fed into, you know, if somehow you could magic magically transport um, today's technology back into the mid nineties, late nineties. I just can't even imagine what that would have been like because there were weeks regularly where the combined audience for both Nitro and raw was north of seven to 8 million people, or that's households. And there's usually a you know, 1.8 or 2.1, whatever the number is now uh, people per household. So you've got millions and millions and millions of people and they would have been able to engage not after the show's over, but while it's going on. So yeah, that would have been awesome. Oh, would have been insane. Eric Bischoff reading mean tweets on air on Nitro. I would have done it. <laughs> I, I know you would have. I would, I would have done mean tweets. I would have done an Eric fires back. I would have tweet, I would have just tweaked people as much as I could. So cool. Think about what if uh, that's more people than who tuned into AW collision this past week, Eric, I'll huh. tell you that <laughs> it was uh a rough week for Collision, and everyone has been waiting and craving your thoughts on this. 452,000 viewers for the first 
pre-taped edition of AEW Collision airing this past Saturday night. Uh, nearly the same as Friday's Rampage show, which did 450,000. The demos were the exact same, 0.13 for 18 to 49. What say you, my friend? I, I wouldn't worry about it too much if I was Tony. Look, it, it's a 4th of July weekend. There's just not a lot of people sitting around watching television over the 4th of July weekend, at least not as many as there normally are. That's one factor. I, when I say I wouldn't be concerned, I would be aware. I wouldn't be panicking. I wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be keeping me up at night, but I would definitely be aware because of 452,000 viewers, that's 40, 45% of of a drop from their initial premiere episode only three weeks ago. And you and I talked about it. I predicted they were going to drop somewhere between 25 or 30 and they dropped 27%. I don't think you could get more accurate than that in, in, in a, in a forecast at least. Um, but when you're losing 40 plus percent within three weeks, let's see what happens next Saturday. If, if next Saturday is a reflection or looks close to where we were this past Saturday, then if I'm Tony, I'm starting to think about things a little bit. What, what do I need to change? What do I need to do? And, and if I'm TNT, is it more outside the church, so to speak? Are you preaching to the choir with your on-channel promotions? Or do you need to go outside mm -hmm. and promote outside of your own network to try to bring some other eyeballs who might not otherwise be all that aware? of AEW. So I, I don't know, man, but a little bit concerned if we see another drop off or even if we come in at 450,000, that's, that to me would be an issue. And I don't think it, it bodes well for the fall. Well, what's going to happen when college football starts? What is yeah. that a month and a half away? Yeah. You get the premier sporting events starting with college football. When does You'll college football start? End of August. I mean, unless Collision is able to build and turn, it see, turn itself into must-see wrestling, it has to be compelling and episodic in order to achieve that. If they can achieve that between now and college football and build a little bit of momentum, they might, might not be such a bloodbath. But if they don't, if they're continuing to dribble in at around 450 or 500,000 viewers leading into college football, I think we're going to see some weeks in the fall where the numbers are high twos, low threes for 200, high 200 thousands, low 300,000 for viewership uh, for, for collision. And, you know, I don't know who knows what, you know, it all depends what TBS is looking for. What were, what were their expectations? Right. Right. And we don't and, know that. And we don't know that. So a lot of the speculation and all this kind of doesn't really mean much. It's just an opinion. It's unless you know what the expectations are or the goals were, if there is a threshold, we don't know what that is. The other thing, though, I, th I think you, you have to think about within the context of business. And again, none of us have any idea what Warner Discovery is hoping for, for collision. But if the ratings continue to deteriorate the way they are, I think Brandon Thurston had a nice post over the weekend. Brandon, I think, laid out six or eight over at WrestleNomics. Six or eight of the top ten uh, TBS-owned, you know, uh, out of the TBS library. Shows that they could do, like Friends. They're doing with Friends now. Um, TBS has a massive, massive library of very popular shows that still do well. They do in the 400,000, 500,000, times, sometimes 600,000 viewers in that Saturday night time slot that Collision is in. If Collision finds itself delivering lower numbers than library material that they've already paid for, they right. don't have to pay to air it again. It's all about where, does, where do they make the most money? And if collision is costing them $50,000 an episode or $100,000 an episode or whatever the number is, I don't know. Maybe you do. I don't know. But it's something. Uh, and, and only delivering numbers that don't even equal what they can do with their existing library, then it's a financial decision. 
but we're not there yet. Yeah, and again, the indication that we've been given from Tony Khan is that this was a David Zaslav request specifically for more AW content on the Turner platforms and that it only goes through the existing television contract, which, as we're led to believe, expires some point fall of 2024. So it's entirely plausible under that pretense there, Eric, that collision could more or less be an experiment well and and, and again i I don't first of all i'm not calling anybody a liar but david zasloff is not programming tbs i can assure you that now there may be another there may be a different relationship beyond just a television licensing agreement between turner and aew if turner owns a piece of aew for example wink wink if Turner does own a piece of AEW, then that's one what we were talking about earlier. That's when the expectations and, and the network's expectations and a long-term plan, you have to have some insight into that. Do I think that David Zaslav went, ooh, I want to see more of Tony Khan's wrestling on TBS? I really don't. Unless it was part of a bigger strategy, and then I could see Zaslav approving something like that. But, I, you know, I, the, the way that story kind of was reported is, you know, David Zaslav wants more wrestling. Mm, we'll see. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. I rarely yeah. am on the show. I'm not sure. My, my, my accuracy is ridiculous. <laughs> I, I mean, weeks in advance, I predict things and they come true. It's just fun. And then when you don't, you get your head shaved. Well, yeah. <laughs> when I'm wrong, I pay, when I'm when I'm wrong, I have to pay for it. <laughs> no, I mean, listen. I also look at it beyond just oh, here's the wrestling program. It's here is live content every single week, or mostly live content every single week that we're guaranteeing that's new. And you know, what is the perceived value of that? But that also begs my question then to you, and I would love your perspective on this because this is something that's very popular in the conversation too. I saw a lot of people saying, well, it was a pre-taped show and. You know, spoilers are out there, so because of that, they're not necessarily tuning in live. Do you think that pre-tape versus live has a marginal or a large effect in viewership in 2023? I think it can. If I were in Tony's shoes right now, I would ascribe 2 or 3% of my loss to that. It's, it, it does happen, but it's usually minimal. It really is. Um, two, three, maybe even 5%. I would, give, I, would, I would write 5% of that loss off to the fact that it was taped. And again, we'll see. Is next week live or tape? I haven't seen the show. So is it ty- live or is it taped? I believe it's live. All right. Well, we'll see. I think next week's a big week. I, again, I, I think if you see an uptick, if we see it bounce back a little bit from – this past weekend, which is, I would expect it would, then I think things are okay. But if we see another dip, mm, mm. the other, the other thing that a a Turner may be doing, if indeed, wink, wink, there's a relationship beyond um, just this traditional TV licensing agreement is Turner may be saying, let's let's throw what we everything we got at this and see how it does. And if it does well and it looks like it'll grow, we'll keep going. If it doesn't, we won't. Could be a two. Could certainly be. Joe from Ad Free Shows wants to know, Eric, do you see AEW doing a streaming site sometime soon? I, I have no idea. I have no idea. I think, you know, just by being aware of things that are going on around us, I think if you, if you don't have a strategy for a streaming site, you're probably sleeping at the wheel. Mm-hmm. So I would imagine that there are discussions or plans or maybe more than that taking place right now. I, I think it's a necessary evil. It's not even an evil. It should be a revenue opportunity, but it's absolutely necessary. I mean, we're, we're talking about it today. You know, we've got a brand new social media platform out there in threads, you know, with technology evolving as rapidly as it does and can, you have to stay ahead of the curve. And I think, Anybody that doesn't have a streaming platform or at least a plan for one in place right now is definitely behind the, behind the eight ball. Do you see All In being part of a streaming effort 
from Turner? Because that's been my that's been my thought process. That I think if if Turner, Warner Bros. Discovery, I should say specifically, if they're going to experiment at all with streaming and wrestling, I think airing the AW Wembley show on the Max platform is the perfect time and chance to do that. Do you see any viability for a one-off to test the waters? Could happen. I mean, it does, you know, it does make sense because it's a big event that's got a lot of buzz. It's going to look fantastic. It is a it is a major international event. Can't discount that at all. And, you know, when an event looks that good and feels that important, you want to show that off to as many people as you possibly can. So, that, I mean, I agree with you. It would be a great opportunity. And if you are thinking about possibly doing something in the future with AEW and on the streaming platform or whatever, then it, it would be. Now, you may also have somebody who's actually running that network who doesn't want to upset the brand or look like a, 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 a lab project for random programming that generally doesn't have any fit or promotion on that network. So I, who knows, man, I don't, I don't like to speculate about things. I have absolutely no understanding of. I don't think it's necessarily speculating though, because I think using context clues, Eric, it would make sense to utilize an event with that much luster and interest in testing the waters with a product that, you already own Turner already Warner Brothers Discovery already owns Max. They have this working relationship with AEW. Where else would they air it? They could air it on natural pay-per-view, standard pay-per-view, but guess what? They've got a pay-per-view the very next week. So I don't see AEW going back to back weeks with traditional pay-per-view where people have to pony up fifty dollars back to back weeks, fifty plus dollars in some cases. I, I think Max makes so much sense for AEW to test the waters with on the streaming platform with Warner Brothers Discovery. It does, unless you're a programmer. <laughs> and then it probably doesn't because it doesn't really fit. Uh, again, that's from a programmer's point of view. You got to you got to think like a programmer and they work really hard and they, 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 they buy content, they create content. Um, all of it designed to fit a very targeted, not just demographic, but socioeconomic demographic as well. So who is the programmer that you're referring to then in this case? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know who that is. But I know that any network has a head of programming. And that person's job and all the people that work underneath them is to develop or purchase content that fits this relatively finely defined image of or, or brand of their audience. That's where programmers get a little funky sometimes. And I've seen a lot of great content. Look at the, the most famous one is uh, what's the, the Mark Burnett show on the Island. Uh, one of the first real successful Survivor. reality shows, Survivor. Not, fear, not fear factor. Um, Survivor. Survivor. Mm -hmm. Survivor was a show that a lot of networks here in the United States, they just couldn't figure out how to make it fit. It didn't fit. It wasn't drama. It wasn't sports. It was, it was this weird little new thing and everybody passed on it until Mark went out and raised the money on his own and bought the time. And it turned into this colossal hit that he ended up owning a piece of for as long. And it's probably still on. Yeah. But the, the reason that he couldn't sell that show, it was because it didn't fit any program network executives profile of their programming content. So when you just drop something in, even though it, I would agree with you that because it's Wembley, because it's in the UK, because it's a wrestling event, because it's so big, it's going to look so great. Absolutely. You would want to showcase it, but not at the expense of your network. That's and that's a conversation between but, executives. But Max wouldn't be undermining their network. Turner is. Tur no, you know, I'm talking about the Max network. Does, AEW doesn't currently exist on Max. There's no promotion for it. There's no anything for it. So just to drop it in like from a helicopter because it's a cool event is kind of incongruent to 
traditional programming strategy. Programmers don't think like that. Accountants do, an entrepreneur would, but programmers don't, they think differently. And that would be a conversation between the head of programming for Max and the head of and, and an executive, um, probably not Zaslav, but somebody close to him. Um, that would be a conversation between those two people. And without knowing, number one, who those people are or what their public positions are on professional wrestling, who knows? Maybe it'll happen. It's not well, a bad idea, but I can understand why it won't either. AEW does have content on Max. Oh, the I old, didn't even know that. The all-access show is available on Max right now. All right. Well, then maybe then it makes more sense, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I just think, and I'm not going to use the word. Well, I'm going to use the word. I just know you hate it. Synergy. That these two entities would have together testing the waters with something like that. I just don't see a way in which AEW does back-to-back -back weekends on traditional pay-per-view. No, that would, be, that, that would be, that wouldn't be smart. And, and Rosie wanted to know, do you think it's a good idea to do all in and all out on back-to-back -back weekends as is? Yeah. I, I mean, it's hard. That, that's going to be a fact. Physically, logistically difficult. But Wembley's going to get so much buzz. There are going to be so many people talking about it. We're going to see a lot of video from it. We're going to see a lot of social media traffic for it. All of that elevates the AEW brand, and it certainly can't hurt the pay-per-view coming up and most likely would help it, I would think. It's common sense. If you got people excited about your product, you've been able to showcase it in front of 70 or 75,000 people. There's a great buzz on it. Hopefully, there'll be a great buzz on it. There should be, unless it just it's a catastrophe inside of the ring, and I don't see that happening. So you've got a great buzz. You've got a showcase event. You've got 70, 75,000 people. Um, damn, how could that hurt your pay-per-view? If anything, you would think that you would drag some of that audience who might not otherwise buy an AEW pay-per-view. Maybe they're not quite convinced yet. They will be after this event. So, no, I think it's a net positive. 75,000 tickets sold for this show so far. You think they can get to 90? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, at, at the When is the event? Sometime in August? It's the last weekend of August. Well, they still have time, right? 20,000 tickets, although the trajectory for ticket sales, it's taken them a while. I mean, they went from zero to 60,000 <clears> in what seems like about five minutes. It wasn't five minutes, but it seemed like it. They went very, very fast. And then it kind of stopped and hovered around 63, 65,000 for quite a while. And now it's back up again, uh, incrementally, compared to the, the initial sales for the first 10 days. I I don't know. Yeah. I got a I got a bit of a bold prediction. I, I think you're going to see just because of the nature of the show and the stadium and the location, I think you're gonna start to see a lot of the former WWE names featured a little more prominently on AW TV in the weeks leading up to all in. Could you You could argue that that's one of the reasons that they're having the success they're having because they you know Europe hasn't seen Moxley and Chris Jericho and yeah, Miro, and look at the abundance of WWE names on that roster that Europe hasn't seen now in five, six, seven but years. On the flip side, they've also never seen AEW, period. So there's curiosity off of that as well. I don't know. We'll see. You know, they, they're still only delivering 55,000, 75,000 viewers per week. So that would suggest that every single viewer that watches AEW bought a ticket. I don't think so. I think there's a percentage of those people that bought tickets, but I think a large percentage of that audience are coming to see talent that they fell in love with in WWE and they haven't seen in five or six years. And you know how you'll know when I'm right or when I'm wrong is when they go back next year. That's when you'll know. See what kind of interest there is there. I, I expect that's going to be a pretty heavy hitting show. And I'm really curious to see how Tony navigates setting up the card for that one, because with two major events and back-to-back -back weekends, the, you could argue that all out the weekend after is even more significant because you're going to have to sell pay-per-views for that. Whereas all in, I feel pretty confident there's going to be some other alternative way of viewing, whether it's on a Turner property or Max or whatever it is. I feel pretty confident that it's not going to be traditional pay-per-view. So 
Uh, we'll see, Eric. We are about a month and a half away from that. It's going to be an amazing event. There's going to be 75,000 plus fans going absolutely nuts. There will be rock hard seeing Will Ospreay versus Kenny Omega three. It's, it's playing right into the fan base, but I also know that they're going to be rock hard, Eric, when they are throwing up that blue chew in their pocket. And they're going to be having themselves a good night. Blue Chew is a unique online service delivering the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. And rumor has it, it even works in the UK, too. So it's multifaceted in that sense. <laughs> yeah, it works in absolutely every time zone. <laughs> The process, well, it's pretty simple. Sign up at bluechew.com. Consult with one of their licensed medical providers. Once you're approved, you're going to receive your prescription within days. And the best part, you can do it all online. No visits to the doctor's office. No awkward conversations. No waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made right here in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. Even right to you in Wyoming there, Eric. I know it's pretty easy for you to get your hands on Blue Chew. Is that correct? It shows up at my door once a month, like clockwork, just like clockwork. How convenient has that been over the time you've been using Blue Chew? It's awesome. Absolutely awesome. Because I don't like to go into the drug. I, I, ugh. Standing in line and waiting. And, ugh. No, man, I just open up my front door, package is sitting right there on my deck, and I'm good to go. And that's the best part. You're going to be good to go anytime you try Blue Chew day, night, morning, after you're feeling the itis following your 4th of July barbecue, all that Wagyu tenderloin, feel like you can't move, you pop a Blue Chew, and all of a sudden there's renewed energy at your fingertips. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And we got a special deal for our listeners here on Strictly Business. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code WrestleBiz, W R E S T L E B I Z, at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code WrestleBiz, to receive your first month absolutely free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring this edition of Strictly Business. Hey guys, Tony Schiavone. Need to call a timeout real quick. Wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling what happened when listeners for a while now about all the cool things happening over on adfreeshows.com. On a new edition of The Insiders, Conrad sits down with former Turner Finance Executive Dirty Dick Cheatham talking about the internal war between WCW and Turner and the Monday Night War with the WWF. And the uh, system said, hey, you're not going to believe who's down there. I said, who, who? She says, China's down there. And I said, what are you talking about? Yeah. And, uh, and I went over to her window and looked at hey, the whole, yeah, all of the eggs is down there. Get the camera. <laughs> so, so we went down there. And of course, they were the eggs exactly what was down there in the fight with security. On a bonus episode of My World, Double J watches back his tag team championship match against FTR and breaks down the hilarious Briscoe farm skit that preceded it. And they say, can y'all be in the background talking? And the four of us are down there, really, just you know, all four of us. But Lethal and Sanjay, I said, we got to start being silly. I just started strumming the guitar, and Sanjay <laughs> started bouncing that baby, and Sanjay and him started doing the dose do dough. I think this is, I don't know, this is the funniest, but I still think it's, it's, a, it's a complete ad lib, but it played to... You know, the line he said, them clowns, and we're down there dancing. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. That's just a small taste of what we got waiting for you. With four levels to choose from, see for yourself. Why Ad Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com. I want to continue our conversation about international pay-per-views, Eric, because... Wembley doing 75K at the same time that WWE is bringing money in the bank over to London and getting this amazing, amazing reaction from those fans there. I think it's opened the door for a lot of opportunities in the near future for wrestling to truly go international with major premium events. And John Cena himself at this Money in the Bank pay-per-view, whether he was prompted to or not, uh, teased the audience with the idea of bringing WrestleMania to the UK. What do you think about the viability of bringing an event like WrestleMania overseas? And uh, 
do you see something like that happening within the next few years? I certainly could see it happening. I, I can't imagine what the staff, the team over at WWE are thinking in terms of having to produce a WrestleMania in overseas. I mean, the logistics are tough. You know, first of all, you got all the travel involved. Um, you're working with a lot of vendors you've never worked with before. You know, um, it, it's, it's going to be a challenge when it happens. It's going to be a big challenge. And of course you have the obvious one, right? You want to be in prime time, whatever day of the week, assuming it's going to be a Friday night or a Saturday night or Sunday, perhaps, um, you know, you want to make sure that that live event is available to the largest sector of your audience, which is domestic U S to buy so they can watch it live and don't have to stay up till two o'clock in the morning in order to do it. So that's the biggest issue. And again, now you've got cost is everything is more expensive when you do it overseas. It's, it's the logistic side of that would just, man, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be on that team. Let's put it that way. I, I just know for, you know, I, go to WrestleMania and I'll be backstage or if you know, they ask me to do something on camera, I've, I've done it recently. Um, when, but you're, if you're backstage, you know, a day before, two days before WrestleMania and you look at the eyes of the people that are there to work, you know, whether it's a production team, or logistics, on ground logistics, by the second day, they're like the walking dead. I mean, <laughs> just be, so adding the stress of doing it internationally on top of that, mind boggling to me. But then again, you know, there's some seasoned vets there. They've been doing it in Saudi Arabia, not to the same extent. It's not a live pay-per-view, but, um, Oh, there's a live pay-per-view. No, I mean, it's a live pay-per-view, but it's not as big in scope. No, in no, not at all. no, um, that's a different animal man. that's a different animal. Yeah. I think you have to think about all the events that come with it too. Aside from just the two day WrestleMania, you got SmackDown, you got raw, you got hall of fame stuff. You got oh. access stuff. There's just a ton of logistics to have to try to comb through. But I don't think that it's implausible in the near future either. And, I mean, the audience is certainly there to support it. We saw them do that massive Clash at the Castle show just last year where they did 50, 60-plus thousand over there. And then you throw in what we're seeing, Wembley, 75K. Rosie wants to know, was John Cena's promo, this hinting of a WrestleMania overseas, was that a reaction to the AEW show, in your opinion? Again, don't know. Could be. I, I, I wouldn't think that would be the driving force behind it. It may have been on the table. For all we know, this is something that's been in discussions for months or a year. Right? You don't sit around in July and go, huh, yeah, we got about another eight or nine months till WrestleMania, and then we got to plan the next one. And where should we do it next? Uh, you know, I, I think, be, especially because the bidding rights, right? The, the amount of money that WWE is paid to bring a WrestleMania to a location is no small chump of no. change. It is massive amounts of money. And those negotiations start taking place years in advance. They don't just start happening six months in advance. There usually would happen a year, probably two or three more than likely is, is when those conversations would start taking place. Um, so I, I, you know, Bob bringing a WrestleMania to the UK has probably been bantered around for a while. Now does Wembley speed that thought process up a little bit, perhaps, but I don't think much. Yeah. Really well, don't. And, and on top of that, I'll throw this other wrinkle into it, Eric, with this Endeavor acquisition. Does the pay-per-view model change for WWE in a few years? It very well may, right? It may not be airing premium live events on Peacock at their own will, whenever they want to, however they want to. For all we know, Endeavor takes over and says, no, this is, how, this is going to be your directive on how you're going to be doing pay-per-views going forward. And the idea of doing a three o'clock PM Eastern standard time pay-per-view domestically for a show that's happening overseas, maybe that's not quite as appealing. Whereas now WWE can just 
throw it on whenever on Peacock. They've already got their money. doesn't really matter. I think that'd be an interesting situation to keep your eyes on. Yeah, that- no, you, you got a good point. Because- and again, it all depends on Now, I did read, and I did read much of it. I just read, basically read the headline. But if what I read, the headline that I read, is, is remotely accurate, you know, John Cena's promo caught the ears of some of the politicians in the UK and mm-hmm. you know, started an interesting amount of energy at that level. I don't think, you know, I don't think John went out there and just won it. I really don't. Um, he's way too much of a professional and, and understands business far too much than to go out there and throw something like that out there just because it felt right in the moment. That's a, that's a rookie move and John Cena is no rookie. So I would imagine, and, and that's why I say, I think this is probably something that's been in the plans or being discussed at least for quite some time. And I think John was told to go out there and do it. Did you see John Cena's promo? No, no, no. It was amazing, Eric, seeing how for so many years John Cena would get these polarizing reactions. The fans would, boo, let's go Cena, Cena sucks. The song would hit, they'd start singing John Cena sucks to his theme song. Now, John Cena comes out, and you would think Michael Jackson was out there. It's unbelievable. Absence absence makes the heart grow fonder factor. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what that is. And he's deserving of it, too. I always felt John got a bad rep from a lot of fans. So seeing him get that adulation, I think, is is well-deserved. I'll be honest, Eric. I think we're more likely to see a Royal Rumble or a SummerSlam in the UK first as a litmus test before we see WrestleMania. And I don't think that's a bad litmus test at all. Those are premium events in their own rights. And I think UK crowds for the Royal Rumble would be fantastic. Uh, but I think that would be a great way to test the market and see what kind of interest there would be for a large scale stadium show at that level for WWE. I, I, I agree. And I, I thought, that, you know, the, the one thing I did think about when I heard about John throwing the WrestleMania tease out there was, wow, why would they, first of all, I know that they're probably locked up or close to it for two or three more WrestleManias in the future. There are negotiations going on at this point. I have to believe with not next year, next year is already done but the following year and probably the year after that in terms of location and cities bidding and things like that. So that, that that's already happening has to be, has to be happening already. Um, which, you know, why would you tease something that you can't deliver for three years, two or three years? Right. But it would make sense to get everybody fired up and maybe announce a WrestleMania f- three years from now, four years from now. But in the meantime, here we come with, and I agree with you. I think Royal Rumble would be awesome. Would be awesome for the UK. Yeah, definitely. McMack says, hang on. Eric called John Cena a thug and an Eminem wannabe back in the day. So you've come around on him, Eric? <laughs> I've always had a massive <laughs> amount of respect for John Cena. Massive. Not only when I worked with him and, and I did a couple things in the ring with him, obviously, and, and had some fun, but just watching him, especially backstage, you know, and, and knowing you know, what his schedule was like. Now, this is back when it's 300 days a year on the road. And, oh, by the way, when you get days off, uh, you're doing Make-A-Wish. You're doing this. You're doing that. I mean, John Cena worked so freaking hard for so long. Um, Nothing but massive respect for John Cena. You got my ear on that one, my friend. I agree with you entirely. Anything else you'd like to hit on here as we wrap up this edition of Strictly Business, Eric? No, I kind of think that's it for now. Yeah. Well, we want you to join our team here on Strictly Business. Head on over to advertisewithericcom Get your product, get your business, whatever it may be, out in front of thousands and thousands of listeners every single week. I don't know if you saw, Eric. I'm pretty sure you did. 83 weeks currently sitting at number one on the Apple podcast charts. And that's 83 weeks in strictly business together at 83 weeks.com. It's a hell of an accomplishment. You should be very proud of yourself. And I'm proud to be part of the team here. We'd love for you to be part of our team as well. Advertise with Eric.com. And don't forget guys, Eric and I are coming to you in Maryland, July 23rd. We're going to be part of MCW's fan jam You buy any combination of the Eric Bischoff meet and greets. There's a bunch of different options for them. 
and you're going to get admission to our live edition of 83 Weeks and Strictly Business. That is Sunday, July 23rd in Joppa, Maryland. It is going to be a blast. Eric Bischoff, anything hey, else? I, I got I got one more. I don't want to forget. Here. On July 26th, I'm going to be at Line Cider Brewing for Best Trivia Ever. Oh, you're best very trivia ever. This ever. is the second time I've done one of these. Best Trivia Ever is an event that takes place. And they, they do hundreds of things around the country. They work with different beer distributors and local clubs and bars and all that. And they put on one hell of a trivia event, and I'm going to be hosting it. So that's Best Trivia Ever. You can find your tickets at besttriviaever.com. I'm going to be in East Greenwich, Rhode Island on the 26th. I think our meet greets start around 7 o'clock, and then we're going to just dovetail our way right into the show. It's going to be a lot of fun, but get your tickets at besttriviaever.com, and we'll see you in Rhode Island. Cannot wait. Lots of great stuff for Eric Bischoff coming up, including next week's edition of Strictly Business, so make sure that you are subscribed to us. 83weeks.com, adfreeshows.com. This has been Strictly Business. We will see you next time.